And now here is Dennis Murray. Good day to you. God bless you. Welcome to Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study hour. Ready to get back into our Father's Word here at the chapel, the fourth book of Moses, the book of Numbers. Uh, we invite you to get your Bible and join us today if you'd care to. We're going to be picking it up in Numbers chapter 5, uh, verse 19. And we'd come to the law of jealousy and uh, what to kind of bring you up to speed where we're at if a man uh, suspected that his wife had been unfaithful to him, in other words, that she had committed adultery, but he didn't have any proof. No one uh, witnessed it, caught them in the act, but still that jealousy exists. And this God giving man a method of getting it out uh, in the open. The jealousy is shaking the marriage down to the core. And the suspicion of infidelity is something that causes a lot of stress in a relationship. And you know, I mentioned that marriage is a relationship that I think is very special uh, to our Heavenly Father. And another reason that I think that, other than the one I stated yesterday, is that uh, he likens uh, idolatry, the worshiping of other gods, small g, to adultery. And that, I think, he's putting it right down where we can understand how he feels about it. And uh, as we left off in our last lecture, the priest, what the man was to do in that case was to bring his wife uh, to the tabernacle where the priest then would take over. And they were to bring, she was to bring a minka, a meat offering, uh, barley, not fine flour, as most uh, meal or, or bread off or meat offerings uh, were to be consisted of, but barley, poor man's bread, in other words, and uh, no oil, no, no, no symbolic of the Holy Spirit, and no frankincense to be mixed in. And then the priest was to take water, uh, collect some of the dust from the floor of the tabernacle where it had been uh, permeated, if you will, with the Holy Spirit, and place that in the water. And then came the vow or the, the, the curse, if you would, and the woman was to uh, agree to the fact that uh, if uh, she was guilty of infidelity, uh, infidelity to her husband, adultery in other words, then this water was going to be injurious to her. However, if she was innocent, uh, the water would not cause injury to her. And we got another ingredient that goes in the water before the woman partakes of it. And let's ask that word of wisdom uh, in Yeshua's name with that introduction. Uh, we're going to pick it up today. Numbers chapter 5, verse 19, and it reads, And the priest shall charge her by an oath, and say unto the woman, If no man hath lain with thee, and if thou hast not gone aside to uncleanness with another instead of thy husband, be thou free from this bitter water that causeth the curse. In other words, this water will have no uh, Im effect on you at all. It's not going to cause you any injury if you are innocent. Verse 20, But if thou hast gone aside, if you've been unfaithful to your husband, to another instead of thy husband, and if thou be defiled, and some man hath lain with thee beside thine husband. If you're guilty, then the curse uh, will take effect. Uh, it's a curse uh, by our Heavenly Father, if you will. And my point, uh, you know, a curse by some person upon another person really is nothing. But a curse from our Heavenly Father, there's no escaping it. And, in some cases, I think a curse from God is probably worse than death, which if the woman had been caught in the act of adultery, Leviticus chapter 20, verse 10, both she and the adulterer were to be stoned to death. That was the penalty for adultery at this time, 21. Then the priest shall charge the woman, this is Shabbat, this charge in the Hebrew Shabbat is to seven oneself, to take an oath, in other words, with an oath of cursing. 
and the priest shall say unto the woman, The Lord make thee a curse and an oath among thy people when the Lord doth make thy thigh to rot and thy belly to swell. This word rot, check it out. Oh, many of you even with reference Bibles have a reference that that word in the Hebrew is to fall. Uh, there's a good deal of controversy as to what physical injury that this that is talking about. Uh, I think uh, probably the, the one that makes most sense to me among the comments of commentators and the uh, notes of scholars is that this is probably some form of dropsy. And if you're like me, you had to go to the Webster's Dictionary to find out what dropsy is, and it's endema, uh, which is a retention of, you know, unnecessary fluids or, or extraordinary amounts of fluids in the body. Uh, this probably a uh, dropsy of the ovaries affecting the part of the body with which the uh, the one accused of the adultery would have used if she was guilty. And most likely the result of this uh, would be that she would be childless uh, the remainder of her days. 22, and this water that causeth the curse, this is the water that she is going to drink, shall go into thy bowels to make thy belly to swell and thy thigh to rot, again in the Hebrew, to fall. And the woman shall say, Amen, Amen. Amen, Amen. Uh, if you translate it, means truth, truth. Uh, in other words, the woman is uh, agreeing to this and that she uh, confirming that the oath has been taken by herself, that she herself made the oath, better said probably, not the priest. 23, and the priest shall write these curses in a book or on a scroll most likely, and he shall blot them out with the bitter water. In other words, he'll write the curse down on the scroll and then submerge uh, the, the scroll into the water, the bitter water if you will, and then the lettering, that uh, the ink that he wrote the words would be uh, absorbed into the water. So we've got dust from the floor of the, uh, the sanctuary permeated with the Holy Spirit and now the water also has uh, absorbed the ink that the curse was written on into. 24, and he shall cause the woman to drink the bitter water that causeth the curse, if she's guilty, I'll add. And the water that causeth the curse shall enter into her and become bitter. Actually, this occurred after uh, the meat offering was made in verse 26. 25, then the priest shall take the jealousy offering out of the woman's hands, this is the minka, that uh, barley that we were talking about back in verse 15, and shall wave the offering before the Lord and offer it upon uh, the altar. And we see in this that innocence is still presumed because someone who was indeed guilty of adultery would be in no uh, position to make a meat offering to the Lord. But uh, we, we see that we're still uh, presuming innocence at this point. 26. And the priest shall take an handful of the offering, even the memorial thereof, and burn it upon the altar, and afterward shall cause the woman to drink the water with the dust from the floor of the sanctuary and the ink, the, the curse written on the scroll uh, absorbed into it. And when he hath made uh, her to drink the water, then it shall come to pass that if she be defiled and have done trespass against her husband, that the water that causeth the curse uh, shall enter into her and become bitter or to produce uh, bitter sufferings, if you will. And her belly shall swell and her thighs shall rot, again, to fall, and the woman shall be a curse 
among her people. And again, this thought to be some form of dropsy or edema uh, of the ovaries. And, you know, this curse of God, again, uh, considered by many probably worse uh, than death. And this would be a tremendous shame uh, upon this woman. You may remember back in verse 18 where we ended yesterday that the woman was to uncover her head uh, prior to all of this procedure beginning. And a woman whose head was uncovered was a sign of loss of morality uh, or conjugal infidelity. So uh, presuming innocence, yes, but uh, a lot of the actions uh, pointing toward guilt. 28, and if the woman be not defiled, in other words, if she didn't uh, commit the adultery as her husband uh, is suspicious that she did, but be clean, then she shall be free and shall conceive seed. She'll be free uh, from the threatened punishment that, that the curse of God would bring upon her uh, if she were guilty. And notice that if she's innocent, that she would be able to conceive seed. And I think that points to the fact that, as I mentioned earlier in verse 21 or 20, that if she was guilty that most likely she would be childless uh, the rest of her life. 29, this is the law of jealousies. When a wife goeth aside to another instead of her husband and is defiled, or she is innocent and he simply has a jealous uh, spirit about him. But, and you know, I, I, I thought to myself about, well, nothing is said about if the woman uh, refused to take the oath and I suppose that had she refused to take this oath that that in one way would be an admission of guilt and therefore the laws of Leviticus chapter 20 verse 10 uh, where an adulterer and an adulteress were be to be killed if they were caught uh, committing adultery. Verse 30 or when the spirit of jealousy cometh upon him, her husband in other words, and he be jealous over his wife, and shall set the woman before the Lord, and the priest shall execute upon her all this law. And I can hear many women now saying, well, what, why doesn't go into if the woman was suspicious of her husband having committed adultery? And you know, at this time, men had more than one wife. And sometimes they had multiple wives and multiple concubines in addition to that. So, and what I'm trying, the point I'm trying to get to is for a man to commit adultery, it would have had to have been with a married woman. That's the only way uh, him lying with another woman would be considered adultery. And in that case, the same law uh, as it applies to the woman, uh, then Leviticus 20.10, I've mentioned several times, uh, where they are both uh, found guilty of adultery uh, to be slain, to uh, be stoned to death. So um, some might think God is not fair and, and women uh, get a little uh, more punishment upon them or, or risk of punishment than the men, but if you really understand his law, uh, it pretty much evens out, as, and the man can be, uh, have the same punishment as the woman. 31, to in the chapter, then shall the man be guiltless from iniquity, and this woman shall bear her iniquity, and the punishment uh, threatened by God if she is guilty. Now, I had asked you when we began this study of the law of jealousy to try and take it to a spiritual level. And I think it's very important for men in particular uh, to take it to a spiritual level because uh, when we consider the bride, the woman, that's all of us, uh, men and women. And that by that I'm talking spiritually now, stay with me. We are, uh, God's elect, are the bride of Christ. And how is he going to feel after having been uh, away from us for 2,000 years if he returns and finds us with child, as it states in Mark chapter 13 
giving suck. And that's not to say that there's anything wrong with a woman having a child when Jesus returns. What's wrong uh, there in Mark 13 uh, that is being taught is that if, if the bridegroom returns after 2,000 years and he finds his bride with giving suck, in other words, she has a child, what does that mean? It means that that bride has been unfaithful. Uh, she, she has has practiced infidelity against the bridegroom. And that's exactly how Jesus is going to feel when he returns and finds some spiritually in bed with Satan. They're not going to be fit to be his bride. And believe me, God is jealous. Uh, if you don't believe it, you need to study Exodus chapter 32 where God says, my name is jealous. Don't go whoring after other gods. Don't worship other gods. Chapter 6 we come to, and I mentioned chapter 5 was in, or I should say, mandatory laws. And when we come to chapter 6, this is going to be voluntary laws. And the subject to start with is going to be uh, the, the vow of a Nazarite. Now, you might give this a little bit of a, a, an introduction a Nazarite, for those of you who don't know, was someone, and it could be a man or a woman, as we'll see in chapter 6, that takes upon themselves a very special vow. Uh, the, the consecration of a Nazarite and much of the, the requirements upon a Nazarite are the same as on the high priest. So. It's a very high calling considered of one who is called to make the vow of a Nazarite. Now, as we're going to be dealing with it in chapter 6 uh, of Numbers, the vow of a Nazarite uh, was for a specified period of time. Uh, the person making the vow would decide that I'm going to uh, leave the, the joys, the sensuous details of the world behind for five years, let's say, as an example, and serve the Lord with all my heart, with all my soul. A Nazarite, too, was one who would go more by the letter of the law than someone who was not uh, of such a calling. So um, in later parts of the Bible, we see Nazarites who were not for a spe specified period of time under the vow of a Nazarite, but rather for a lifetime uh, under the vow of a Nazarite. So with that introduction, let's go with chapter 6, verse 1, and it reads, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, verse 2, Speak unto the children of Israel, and say unto them, when either man or woman shall separate themselves to vow a vow, this vow a vow in the Hebrew means it's a, a special vow, of a Nazarite to separate themselves unto the Lord. The word Nazarite here is nazir in the Hebrew, and it means uh, consecrated or separated. Now, um, there were people, as I mentioned, in, in God's Word who did not make this decision on their own. Uh, Samson, for example, you may recall in, in Samuel chapter 1, his wife, his mother's name, uh, Hannah, uh, she was not able to have children, and she was very distraught about it. And uh, she was making her supplication to the Lord, asking Him for a child, and mouthing the words. You may remember Eli saw her and accused her of being drunk, but uh, the Lord heard uh, her prayer, and she gave, son, uh, to a, to gave birth to a son named Samson, who was under the vow of a Nazarite from birth and for his entire life. Uh, another who was under the vow of a Nazarite for forever was Samuel, and, and I think I just mixed up Samuel and Samson, I apologize for that. It was Samuel in, in 1 Samuel uh, that his mother uh, was under that condition, but uh, Samson was basically the same in the book of Judges. His mother was unable to conceive, and God gave him a child that she prayed for, and they said, oh, he's going to be a Nazarite all his life. 
And then in the New Testament, you have John the Baptist uh, was under the vow of a Nazarite his entire life as well. Verse 3, he shall separate, separate here is a form of the word nazar, which means to abstain himself from wine and strong drink, and shall drink no vinegar of wine or vinegar of strong drink. Neither shall he drink any liquor of grapes, nor eat moist or fresh or green grapes, or dried, dried grapes, of course, uh, being raisins. And uh, anything that came from the vine, the Nazarite was to abstain from nothing from the vine, and all, and all from the vine uh, regarded as sensual uh, pleasures. Hosea chapter 3, verse 1, uh, they're called flagons there, F-L-A-G-O-N-S, but these were just raisin cakes, uh, and, and, and it's thought to be, you know, uh, evil, if you will, because they represented everything of the enjoyments of the flesh life. And, the Nazarite was supposed to give up all flesh enjoyments of life while he was under, or she, I'll add, was under the vow of a Nazarite. You know, and uh, this gets me that you have some who read one poorly translated verse in the New Testament and think that God won't use women uh, to do his work. And, and they say in the New Testament, Paul's teaching that a woman should not speak in church where it should be translated a woman should not chatter in church means that women have no business in the pulpit. Well, Acts chapter 2, uh, Joel chapter 2 tells us that in the latter days God will use his sons and his daughters to prophesy. So don't let anyone tell you that uh, women are just supposed to sit in church and keep their mouth shut. Uh, there were many prophetesses in God's Word. That's someone who God used to speak His Word or teach uh, His Word. And these who are on an equal footing, I think, basically with the high priest as far as their requirements, women allowed to be a Nazarite as well. Verse 4, All the days of his or her separation shall he eat nothing that is made of the vine tree from the kernels, kernels meaning from even the very smallest part, even to the husk, nothing to abstain completely from the vine. Verse 5, all the days of the vow of his separation, there shall no razor come upon his or her head until the days be fulfilled, in the which he separateth himself unto the Lord. He shall be holy and shall let the locks of the hair of his head grow. And this hair growing, hair growth, a sign of uh, vitality, if you will. And Samson, you know, what is the, uh, the most commonly taught or known thing about Samson is that supposedly his strength was in his hair. That wasn't what God's Word teaches us at all because when Samson was blind and working in a grist mill as a mule would, his hair grew back and he still didn't have his strength. But he prayed to God to give him his strength back just this one more time. So Samson's strength came uh, not from his hair but from the Lord. But uh, this... Uh, I think it indicates too that this hair will be worn throughout the time that this one is under the vow of a Nazarite in honor and glory to the Lord, almost uh, like a diadem that the high priest would wear in his turban or his headdress. Uh, the hair of a Nazarite was worn as a diadem in honor of our Father. Verse 6 all the days that he, sep he separateth himself unto the Lord, he shall come at no dead body, not to come in contact, even if it was an immediate family member. Uh, in the book of Leviticus, we learned that uh, the priests uh, were allowed to go to uh, their immediate family, a father, mother, brother, sister, 
and attend to their funeral. But the high priest was not allowed to go to uh, an immediate family member who had passed on and tend to their funeral. There was to be no contact with the dead. And again, we see a similarity uh, with the, those under the vow of a Nazarite and those who came uh, under the vow of, uh, under the, the responsibilities of the high priest. Verse 7, he shall not make himself unclean for his father or for his mother, for his brother or for his sister when they die because the consecration of his God is upon his head. And again, consecration in Hebrew uh, being the separation. And uh, Yahweh is the God of the living, uh, not the God of the dead. Verse 8, all the days of his separation he is holy or, or separated, if you would, unto the Lord, not to get caught up uh, in the things of the world. Verse 9, And if any man die very suddenly by him, and he hath defiled the head of his consecration, or his consecrated head, probably better translated, then he shall shave his head in the day of his cleansing. On the seventh day shall he shave it. And uh, if, you know, some might say, well, that doesn't seem fair. You know, if he didn't go to this one uh, uh, on purpose and they just died next to him, that's just chance that that happened. But still yet, he's defiled uh, by the dead. And, and you can take this to a spiritual level as well because in, in Ezekiel chapter 44, verse 25, remember God's priest, the Zadok, uh, can go to the spiritually dead, their mother, brother, sister, uh, etc., who didn't make the first resurrection of Revelation chapter 20 and try and help them. But there is a price to pay, and they're unclean for seven days. So here we see how many days was it that, that the Nazarite had to wait before he could even uh, be forgiven for this, and there's a process for him to be forgiven seven days. You see the uh, uh, significance, verse 10. And on the eighth day, he shall bring two turtles or two young pigeons to the priest, to the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. And of course, turtles, we're not talking about uh, two reptiles, that's unclean. He was to bring two turtle doves or two young pigeons uh, for uh, a sin offering and a burnt offering, as we'll see in verse 11. Verse 11, and the priest shall offer the one for a sin offering and the other for a burnt offering and make an atonement for him for that he sinned by the dead and shall hollow his head that same day and consecrated it uh, afresh or anew under the vow of a Nazarite. And this word sinned here uh, in the Hebrew is kata and it's to fall short or, or miss the mark. And if you think all sins are equal in God's eyes, uh, and you have a companion Bible, make a note of Appendix 44, and you'll learn that there are about 12 different Hebrew words for sin and the required atonement uh, for those sins varies depending on the severity of the sin. And again, many might say, well, how did this Nazarite falls short. I mean, he was walking down the street and this guy keeled over dead from a heart attack and he was there and he was defiled by the dead. What did he do to sin? Well, he fell short. He fell short of making the five years, let's go back to that we used as an example of his vow to be a Nazarite. And there's a penalty to pay, verse 12. And he shall consecrate unto the Lord the days of his separation and shall bring a lamp of the first, a lamb, excuse me, of the first year for a trespass offering, but the days that were before shall be lost because his separation was defiled. Now, now what this means, in other words, is that uh, if this day that the, this guy killed over dead from a heart attack in the street next to him, ha and he had vowed for five years to be a Nazarite, if this happened on after four years and 300 days, 
that four years and 300 days was lost uh, under his vow of a Nazarite, and it starts all over again. Verse 13, And this is the law of the Nazarite. When the days of his separation are fulfilled, he shall be brought under the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. When the number of days of the vow had been completed. Now in verses 13 uh, through 21 the, concerning the release from the vow of a Nazarite and also a very special uh, sacrificial meal enjoyed by the Nazarite. Verse 14, And he shall offer his offering unto the Lord, one he lamb of the first year without blemish, for a burnt offering, a burnt offering and an admittance offering to the presence of God, if you will. And one ewe lamb of the first year without blemish for a sin offering, these for involuntarily committed sins during the period of time that this party was under the vow of a Nazarite. And one ram without blemish for uh, peace offerings, and the peace offerings covered in Leviticus chapter 3, and this will be what the sacrificial meal is taken of, part of it uh, given to the priest as their portion, uh, part of it being enjoyed uh, by the party making the offering. Verse 15, And a basket of unleavened bread, cakes of fine flour mingled with oil. In the case of the law of jealousy, you remember barley, meal here, we have fine flour, the very best, mingled with oil, oil always symbolic of the Holy Spirit, and wafers of unleavened bread anointed with oil, and their meat offering and their drink offering, these offerings appointed to accompany uh, the other offerings, the peace offering, etc. But uh, again, the burnt offerings, you, you noticed in verse 14 and the sin offering, and the peace offering all to be without spot or blemish. Why? Because they're types for Jesus Christ. He was completely innocent. He was without spot or blemish. The fine flour, the very best mingled with oil, also symbolic of Jesus Christ. Well, when we come back in our next lecture, lecture we'll uh, finish up with the vow of a Nazarite and the release from his vow uh, a very special time in the life of the Nazarite, and we'll cover more on that when we come back in our next lecture. We've got a short message. We'll ask you to listen a moment, won't you please?